The JFK 35 podcast is made possible through generous support from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. It is time in short for a new generation of leadership. For courage, not complacency, is our need today. Leadership, not salesmanship. And the only valid test of leadership is the ability to lead and lead vigorously. I'm Matt Porter, and in this episode, we'll speak with members of the new generations that followed President Kennedy and how they are continuing to carry on his call to public service. Next on Let Us Begin, a new generation of leadership. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. Sixty years after President Kennedy's administration, fewer than one in five people in the United States have a living memory of the president. But his legacy continues to live on in those generations that came after him. This podcast name, Let Us Begin, comes from President Kennedy's inaugural address, where he laid out that the work yet to be done would not be finished during his administration, nor even in the lifetimes of those present that day. Instead, the work he started would have to be continued by later generations. Today, we will speak with those who were born and grew up decades after President Kennedy's administration. We will ask them how they have picked up the torch and continued the work President Kennedy and his administration moved forward during his time in office. Our first guest answers the call President Kennedy made in his inaugural address more than 60 years ago. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Joining me now is Emily Cherniak, the founder and executive director of New Politics. New Politics believes there are inherent organizational structures that keep candidates who have past experiences in service roles, such as military veterans or Peace Corps volunteers, from successfully running for office. The organization is committed to building a new pipeline into politics for Americans who have served our communities and country and who feel called to continue their service through civic engagement and politics. In addition to Cherniak's work in Washington, she has served in AmeriCorps, which is a program that developed from the original Peace Corps program founded by President Kennedy in 1961. Emily, thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. This podcast is about President Kennedy's 60-year legacy, 60 years of his administration. And um, we brought you in because of your work in public, in public service, in fact, recruiting public servants. Tell us a little bit about yourself and um, where your career has gone and what you're doing now at New Politics. Yes. So I am the founder and executive director of New Politics, and we are an organization that seeks to revitalize democracy by recruiting and supporting servant leaders to run for office, people who have served this country in the military, in the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps programs like City Year, Teach for America, and other types of public service-minded leaders, and to get them into the political arena and help them win elections. Mm -hmm. And where did you start before, you know, again, just to give us a little sense of where you came from, where did you start in your career and how did you end up getting to the point where you founded this organization? Yeah, I am, I would say the most uh, unlikely founder of what I do now. I, by accident, sort of came into the political space. I really got my start in service. After college, I found AmeriCorps and did a program called City Year in Boston. And it really changed my life and it really put me on a path to service. And I worked with at-risk young people in the city of Boston, in Boston public schools. And I really loved it and thought I would be doing that for the rest of my life, really working with young people. And in 2009, Senator Ted Kennedy passed away and there was a special election in Massachusetts, as we all remember. And my boss, Alan Casey, who co-founded City Year, 
and, you know, decided to jump into the special election to run for the U.S. Senate. And, you know, Volan told me to, to work on his race. And, you know, I knew nothing about politics or campaigns. Ironically, I had gone to school in D.C. for college, and I was like the only person that didn't work on the Hill or intern on the Hill. I was in, you know, volunteering in Head Start programs in Washington, D.C., you know, not on Capitol Hill. So that was sort of my... I made a, what I would say now, a false choice to kind of choose service and not politics and not really understanding that they are connected. But I really did nothing political until Alan said, I need you on the campaign. And so that experience really was eye-opening for me. And and I learned a lot of tough lessons about, about politics and the world of campaigning, which led me to then start new politics. So so much I want to talk to you about your service background and how that sort of and how you came to see service and politics as sort of interconnected. But I guess I'm going to start with this basic question, you know, as you are one of the 80 to 90 percent of people now who live in the world who never lived during President Kennedy's administration. What when did you learn about President Kennedy and how what was, was your relationship? Was it kind of just, oh, I knew him in history books or how, how did his how did what you knew about him at all, you know, influence your work or what you were doing or, you know, just how did you see President Kennedy growing up? You know, I growing up, I'm from the Midwest, so I grew up in Minnesota. And so I really knew nothing about him other than he was president. And he said, ask not what our country can do for you, what you can do for our country. Right. So I really knew nothing else about him. And then I came to Boston for AmeriCorps. And obviously, Massachusetts, it just is a very different sort of culture around President Kennedy. And I think you sort of are immersed more in the in the Kennedy like stories and history. Ironically, now is when I feel like I he is the most inspirational to me in the work I do because of his journey from you know, service to politics, which is very similar to a lot of journeys that our candidates take. And I, you know, I would say it was probably 10 years ago that I learned about his story about how he ran for office as a veteran and he won a 10 way primary and was the only veteran in the race. And I think we always think like, oh, of course he won. He was a Kennedy, but they weren't really, you know, the Kennedy family was not the political dynasty that they, you know, are now back when he was running. And he really won because of his service and his and being a veteran. And I think he would he has said that he he won because he was the only veteran in the race. And he really set the tone for, you know, his campaign slogan was a new generation offers a leader. And it's really interesting the parallels to what I do now at my job. We talk a lot about a new generation of service leaders, you know, in politics and sort of inspired by what he what he did and what he started you know back when he first ran for congress and that whole culture of the servant leaders that he was you know he got elected and and about i think like significant number of the new class had service backgrounds because of the obviously the the world war ii the general you know the greatest generation of what we know them now but he really was sort of leading this kind of new generation of leaders to get into politics that had a service background which fundamentally change the country for the better. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned you worked in AmeriCorps and City Year, which are both sort of offshoot inspirations from the original idea of the Peace right. Corps. Yes. Uh, and we actually got had the privilege in this episode to talk to a couple Peace Corps volunteers. But, you know, how does that, like now with what you're doing with servant leadership and you look back at President Kennedy's, you know, that original legacy of starting the Peace Corps, this idea that Americans would give up a year or two years of their life um, for service. You know, how does that resonate with you now? Yeah, I mean, at the time it was, I I think, a really revolutionary, incredible idea. And they always say that AmeriCorps is like the the domestic Peace Corps. And so I think he was a pioneer in thinking about, you know, what that would be like for people in this country to serve, not only, you know, because you can serve in the military, but that really wasn't serving in serving in a non-military way was not really something that we did as a country. And so it really created this opening for Americans to think about service, you know, not just from a military standpoint, but from a, a national service, you know, international service standpoint. And so it really, I think, created a whole new sort of paradigm for us as Americans to believe that we can contribute to this country, which ultimately is the way we can like survive and revitalize and continue our democracy. 
is through us serving because I think it just connects us more to our communities and our country and to each other. So it was revolutionary and it's, I mean, it still is. And he really set the tone for what, you know, came out of that and, and what we are still doing today. You know, when you mentioned growing up in Minnesota, you knew he was president, you knew he said, ask not what your country can do for you. And that's mostly, you know, the country, what they learn about him in that, you know, paragraph of the textbook or whatever comes out. We always try to promote the fact that there's so much of his legacy that is applicable. You obviously came to his service legacy and really got to understand what he was asking the country to do. Do you find that as your, you know, other people get older people in your generation that they may encounter President Kennedy's ideal, particularly if they go to Washington and go into politics. But do you find that, you know, what people might learn initially in history books, that there's a lot of President Kennedy out there for people to connect with as they get older and actually get into their careers and lives? You know, we talk about moonshots here. Yeah. And I I think it's even even I, I think I wish younger people would know the stories that I think it would connect them more to even his you know, kind of serving in the military or just his, what, what it means to sort of raise your hand and say like, I want to serve my country. And, and I think young people understanding that piece of, of his life and, and what it meant to serve and, and how service really, you know, impacted the decisions he made as a leader, because I think anyone with, and any one of our candidates who have, has served will say like their service was really transformational in teaching them how to lead and how to like, you know, show up in the world as a way about putting your community and country first. So I think it's not just for those of us that have gotten older to sort of really kind of learn more about and, ap- and apply that to our career. But but I do think, and I wish that more young people would sort of know that piece of, of his history as well, because I think it would really help them as they navigate their life choices. You know, President Kennedy wrote the book Profiles and Courage. Don't know how familiar you are with that, but he lay, he lays out these, I believe, eight senators who are examples of what you know, a public servant should be. I assume at your job, um, and you know, I you know, never know about assuming, but I assume that when you talk to, you know, people who you want to get into the race, perhaps you talk about politicians in the past as examples. And does Kennedy fit in those type of examples that you want to encourage your your future people that you're recruiting to be? Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up that book. I I have read it. You know, courage is one of our core values as an organization at New Politics because, you know, we fundamentally believe that you have to have courage to be a political leader and that it takes courage. And I think President Kennedy embodied that every day. I think that we talk a lot about courage. And actually, Congressman Seth Moulton, when he, you know, he was the first candidate that I recruited to run for office and he was sort of like the pilot you know, and when he got elected, he went to Congress. And the one thing he said to me that he has said, you know, publicly now that he said, I was surprised because he had never, you know, the first congressman his parents met was him, right? Like he had, he was not political and he had never been to the Hill. And he said, after being there for a short time, that he, he was surprised. He thought people were a lot smarter than he thought they were going to be. They were hardworking, but the thing that he saw was lacking was courage and that, he was surprised at how many members of Congress, his colleagues, lacked like real courage to do the right thing. And so I think courage is a huge piece of like what we what we look for when we vet candidates, what we talk about, and what we really are inspired by when President Kennedy's, you know, role model of of courage in his leadership. And so I guess the last question is, you know, again, going back to that, what you learned in history. And what do you hope that future generations, will continue to learn or take away um, from President Kennedy, from his example? I think it's so, politics is so hard right now. And I don't want, I don't want young people to be turned off by the sort of toxic environment that they perceive in politics and not to get involved in politics. And I hope that they would sort of see and take lessons from President Kennedy's, you know, willingness to, think about politics from a place of service, to think about politics from a place of courage, and that leadership is hard, and and that what real leadership looks like is about, you know, being able to bring people together to do what you think is right and to not be afraid to do the hard things, and that and you can achieve change if you do that. And I think if they can take those lessons and get involved in politics, it would be a tribute to his legacy for who he was as a political leader. Well, Emily, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was an honor to be here.
In 1961, President Kennedy, with help from his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, developed the Peace Corps. Since its inception, the Peace Corps has sent more than 240,000 Americans with special skill sets to volunteer in more than 140 countries. In a signing statement establishing the Peace Corps on March 1, 1961, President Kennedy said the service of each volunteer would be difficult, but it would be a worthwhile endeavor to build foundations for peace across the globe. It will not be easy. None of the Men and women will be paid a salary. They will live at the same level as the citizens of the country which they're sent to, doing the same work, eating the same food, speaking the same language. We're going to put particular emphasis on those men and women who have skills in teaching, agriculture, and in health. I'm hopeful that it will be a source of uh, satisfaction to Americans and a uh, contribution to uh, world peace. Today, I'm joined with two recent Peace Corps volunteers. Kivon Baton, who has spent time in Vanuatu as an education volunteer from 2017 to 2019, and also Alejandra Garcia, who lived in Peru from 2016 through 2020, first serving as a youth development volunteer and later a Peace Corps volunteer leader. Kivon and Alejandra, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. It's a uh, pleasure to be here, too. <laughs> so happy to have both of you here uh, as returning Peace Corps volunteers, a major program that President Kennedy started during his administration. I want to start first so the audience can get a little bit to know you. Uh, tell me a little bit about your Peace Corps trips and why you also decided to apply uh, for the Peace Corps. Either one of you can start. So I actually learned about the Peace Corps after doing a year abroad as a Rotary Youth Exchange student after high school and before going to college. And so I spent a year in the south of Brazil as a Rotary Youth Exchange student and upon returning, uh, knew that I wanted to have another experience abroad. And so I started looking at what those, what that, how I could, I guess, kind of go abroad again, but also wanted to, to serve, service others while I was abroad. And so I learned about the Peace Corps and for four years, actually, it, the, the Peace Corps experience actually was on my vision board. And so I'd look at it every day and imagine being what it would be like to be a Peace Corps volunteer. And after graduating from Appalachian State University with a degree in finance and banking, I um, applied for the Peace Corps and was accepted and went to Vanuatu to be an education volunteer uh, from 2017 to 2019. What yeah. really inspired me to want to uh, be a Peace Corps volunteer was the opportunity to not only go abroad, but to, to service others while abroad and yeah, and, and very happy that I did it with all the relationships and the impact that I think that I had during my service. Yeah, so I would like to share when I heard first about the Peace Corps was actually in my last year or so of my undergraduate at the University of Redlands. I was getting a biology and chemistry degree there on track to be a nurse is my original goal. And at 21, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do fully. So I applied for a master's in social work, an accelerated nursing program, and the Peace Corps. And I ended up hearing about the Peace Corps through a sociology professor. And when I was able to finish my last semester, close to graduation, I got my acceptance letter to Peace Corps Peru and told myself that this is an opportunity of a lifetime. I was very excited to work outside of the U.S., and I ended up putting off grad school and served in the Peace Corps from 2016 all the way to the pandemic in 2020 as a youth development volunteer in Amazonas, Peru. And that's amazing. And um, just so that we can learn a little bit more, maybe Alejandra, start with you, uh, and then I'm going to come to you, Kevon. But what, what did that work entail as a youth development volunteer? What were the type of things you were doing over that long, much longer tenure of service than even for a normal volunteer? Yes. Yeah, so my first two years as a Peace Corps volunteer, mm -hmm. I served within youth development, which was pretty much working with local counterparts. I was assigned to two high schools in the small town of Pedro Ruiz Gallo mm -hmm. in Amazonas, Peru, where I worked with what they call the tutoria teacher, mm -hmm. which can be similar to the life skills here or health class that we might have here in the U.S. I worked with them training non-formal education and also incentivizing youth activity and youth leadership within the community. So I would work with teachers, I work with city hall officials, and then I would work with who we called adult leaders. 
anyone in the community, whether that was someone from the market, if that was someone from the bank, whoever it was that wanted to work with our youth, and we developed youth-led projects. Along the line, I was able to develop out a portfolio and claim a youth as a youth development leader within that region, a parent as an adult leader within the community, and also what we called a counterpart within the city, uh, just an adult who would be considered a community leader. Those were my first two years. My second, my last two years, I served as the Peace Corps volunteer leader, also known as PCVL. So I moved to the, the capital of the region I was in, worked directly with what would be similar here, the Department of Education. And I worked there at a bigger scale, training all teachers within the region on non-formal education, while also working with our Peace Corps counterparts and providing mentor, mentoring and coaching to all 54 volunteers in the region. And Kivon, what, you also were in education. What were the type of things you were doing in your placement? Yes. Uh, so I was teaching English to about 100 or 200 students, anywhere from kindergarten to eighth grade, primarily focused on phonics skills as well as reading and, and writing English. And then was also able to do a secondary project where my community and I wrote for a grant from the USAID we were awarded that grant, and so we were able to bring solar powered lighting to our to our school's campus, um, which was very helpful. A lot of the students would actually walk to school on a Sunday evening and then spend the night at the school throughout the week and in the campus dorms and then go back to school on the on Friday afternoon. And so that solar powered lighting gave them kind of comfort and safety and security within their their campus dorms as well as gave some of the teachers who also lived on the campus the ability to work within the evening time and that safety and security as well. When President Kennedy, um, again, both of your experiences are just so fascinating and we could really do a deep dive just into there. But I do want to talk a little bit about the foundation of the Peace Corps. You know, when President Kennedy envisioned this idea of, you know, people with skill sets, doctors, engineers, teachers, others, anyone with valuable skills that they learned here in the United States and to go out and sort of take those skills out to countries where they're needed. For How was that first envisioned from President Kennedy? From your perspective, how has the Peace Corps done living up to that? And maybe if there's a way to talk about it in like one experience that you had, the kind of a sort of experience that em embodies the Peace Corps mission. If you have had one experience during your time, you know, maybe tell us about one of those experiences. I'm sure you've had many and either one of you can start. I can share. So for me, the Peace Corps, when I learned about I think at the root of it, the Peace Corps has three missions, right? We want to send people that are professionals to a different country and train, build capacity, whatever it is in our sector. And then we also want to promote that understanding between Americans and the host country. So one experience that I can share is one of my best socios is what we call them in Spanish or counterparts. And she was a great community leader. She ended up participating after we worked for about a year together in what we called a Feria Vocacional, which is a college fair for the first ever that we had in our community. And she was able to meet other Peace Corps volunteers. And we were able to, first of all, show the diversity of America. My experience a lot of the times was being told, you're not a Peace Corps volunteer from America, you're from Mexico. Sadly, that was one thing that you have to teach someone what an American looks like and show that difference. One of the things that with this professor is after meeting a diverse group of people, she was able to connect with someone who actually had a experience in the university where they went as a teacher that spoke English to the US and participated in this three day training. And I think for me, that was something where we build the capacity, I was able to work with her, both formally and helping her English developed, but also those different skills, talking to someone, getting out of that shyness that sometimes I saw in a lot of the women counterpart that I worked with. And she ended up going to the US, something that she never dreamed of. And I think that to me was the best experience of being able to see Peace Corps' impact on a person's life. She currently still works at the high school where I worked with her. She leads that fair. Obviously the pandemic shut it down for a little bit. I'm still in contact with her. And I am really excited. I think she was probably one of the best impacts I feel that Peace Corps had in that community. And I did a part of it, but her building her capacity after being shown, I think is a root of what we do. And Kivon, if there's sort of one exchange that you remember that sort of embodies those ambitions of the Peace Corps, um, what could they be? Yeah, I think one of those that really it, one of those experiences that really embodies that transform 
that transformative power of um, the Peace Corps service that I was able to experience during my time in Vanuatu was actually having a young student who was from a nearby island come and speak to my school. And she was actually a student at Emory University here in, in the U.S. And um, her first experience with kind of, I guess, the outside world was having a Peace Corps volunteer volunteer in her community when she was younger. And so fast forward 10 years down the road and, and she was went to Emory University studying medicine and, and hoping to bring back those, those medical skills to her community in Vanuatu. And she was actually able to come to my school and talk to the students. And that was a, a true blessing. They were so inspired by her and it extended beyond, you know, the kind of relevance that I could give the students. And yeah, really just that en enduring relevance of, of, of Kennedy's vision embodied in that moment and hope that, you know, we all hope that that's our story one day where we can touch the lives of other people and may not even know, you know, how we've changed their lives, but having that impact is, is, is so profound. So yeah, it was very, it was very eye-opening, very inspiring to myself and both the students. Both those stories are just fantastic to see and to, and to see sort of the President Kennedy's vision acted out 60 years later, still going on. Of course, there was another vision of the Peace Corps beyond just bringing the skill set. Alejandra, um, you touched on this briefly, but we'll go into a little more, is there was this sort of diplomatic aspect of the Peace Corps. In President Kennedy's time, the Cold War was heating up, and President Kennedy's hope is that by sending Americans abroad to promote peace and to promote understanding between nations and cultures, uh, obviously we're no longer in a Cold War mentality, but there are many other reasons to still continue to promote peace and bridge the divides between cultures. How did your role go as cultural ambassadors for the United States? And again, if there's a particular story that makes sense, to describe, you know, what this meant for you, that's always wonderful. Yeah, I can think of several instances where people were very surprised to learn that I was from from the U.S. I had the same skin tone as as the host country nationals, so I blended in, and that was just one more element and layer that I could bring to the American experience and um, people's experience of America. And I think in that very specific instance, it made the American people seem even more. I think more alike than different, I think in that in that sense for those host country nationals. And um, yeah, really just appreciated that, that the experience to be able to, to connect in that way and, and feel very um, like at home and at, and at peace. And I think that they felt that as well. And I felt like I was invited into the community in ways that maybe other volunteers might not have been. And also given that broader sense of what it was like to be an American. And, I, and just one funny story that I can, I guess, kind of embodies that as well was actually finding at a local like thrift shop I think once there was a connect four game and um, I was able to bring that back to the community and we all played connect four and it was just one of those very simple ways that we became connected and and I guess an experience of American culture so it was it was over laughs so okay. it was nice that's very charming um, and I love connect four as a kid so I, ma I imagine your students loved it as well Alejandro, is there anything that speaks to you about um, sort of being a cultural ambassador as well as someone to provide skills? Yeah, so I believe like when we're culture ambassadors in the host country that we're in, I think for me that was one of the first times in my life. I was 21 when I first joined where I really was very in in my face you are an American like identity as an American citizen something that I, I can say here in the U.S. I didn't necessarily have to navigate that as much I'm from California from Southern California so we have a lot of diversity within our population but going to the Peace Corps I think there was two moments and I'll share one of them where I think it showed the diversity and it was in family family day in the Peace Corps, when you get sent to your site, we had the opportunity to have all, we were Peace Corps Peru group 28, and we hosted two days where we got to meet who our host family was gonna be, and they got to see all the volunteers. So the volunteers were different ages, we were different ethnicities, different races. We all came from a range of places within the US. And also when we met the the Peruvians, our host country nationals, we saw diversity within them as well. Some people lived in the more populated areas of the region where they were, let's say, working within the government or working at a bank versus we had people that were going to be going to rural sites where there was people that came in their best dress, which was their campesino outfit 
outfits, which is their normal wear. So it was interesting to show that diversity. And then we got training in that in our Peace Corps family day. And it was probably one of the most exciting parts. And I always paint this picture where I felt like a puppy being put up for adoption. It's a weird way of saying it, but you're waiting for who's your Peace Corps family? Who's this host country um, family that adopted you for this time? And I still keep in touch with my Peace Corps family. I'm actually going to a wedding. I've shared that, I think, before. And it's a, about continuing that story, not just for your two years, but how you continue it moving forward. I met so many friends that became lifelong friends and i think i continuously share the diversity just by talking about it and here you'll hear me talk about the peace corps almost anytime i get a chance that's wonderful and the connections both of you made seem so strong definitely embodies what president kennedy hoped the um the service would become speaking of president kennedy this is all about his 60th anniversary of his administration you both sort of represent the third or fourth generation wherever you want to draw that line since president kennedy's administration so for you you know being kind of further removed from you know his presidency what was your what is your impression of president kennedy or his administration if you have any what what does he represent for you you know being so far removed from his ad administration so for me i will be honest until the peace corps and maybe a little bit of history class in high school i didn't know much we knew about jfk we knew he was assassinated i knew things like that but I didn't get to know more about that former president we had up until I joined the Peace Corps. And then you get curious. One of the things that I keep to my heart a lot is JFK's fight for equal rights and opportunities for all Americans. He was a very active person within the public government and also not not afraid to kind of rattle our, our normalcy, I want to say, at the time. So I think to me... Being older now, I am involved in working with city governments, so I leverage that and always remember what JFK did in terms of creating something that didn't exist. It's something that you thought it was an idea that he thought back in 1960, it became a thing in 1961. And now, how many years are we? Over, Over 60, 60 years? years? Over 60 years of this legacy of the Peace Corps and how it's adapted. I think that to me is always at the forefront of my mind is creating something that wasn't there. And it it inspires me till this day because I reflect on that quite a bit with JFK. And yeah. And Kevon? Yeah, I would say um, his 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 speech, his inaugural address on, on January 20th, 1961, really just embodied, you know, unity, global connectedness and global cooperation. And it's something that I really try to be a proponent of here here today. I, I started an organization called Elevated Up and Out. Where I'm helping to take young underprivileged youth abroad and help them to get their passports and complete a short week long community service project while abroad. So it's something that directs me and, and has directed me before I even knew about about the I guess the kind of the values that he was proposing. And it's nice to see someone with with such power proposing those those values of you know, freedom and, and democracy, but also the betterment in, of humanity through through understanding and especially through service. So hoping to embody those and, and help other youth and underprivileged youth really experience the embodiment of those values and hope for that that can have the same transformative experience in their lives as it has in mine and they can learn the power of service. And I do think both of you, by being Peace Corps volunteers alone, um, shows a level of commitment to public service that most people don't have. So thank you for that. You know, speaking of sort of your generation, your gener you guys sort of kind of on that line between millennials and Generation Z. You're kind of like right there in the middle. But your generation, whether, wherever you draw that line, has been on the forefront um, of speaking up for issues ranging from climate change, gun control, economic inequality, civil rights, others. And in 1960, Kennedy told his generation that they, quote, had the power to make their generation the best of mankind or make it the last. How do you view the importance of public service among your generation? And is there anything you draw from Kennedy's words that can help you or that, you, that resonates with you? I think when I think to JFK's quote, make it the best or make it the last, it's a little daunting. But at the same time, I see it as you have the power to do something. And I think empowering people to believe they can actually make a change is something that 
is hard to do in many times. And when we think about our local government, we think about our state government, even our higher up, sometimes people are so disconnected. And I think in our generation, one of the powers that we have and me and my age group is inviting people to be connected to their local government. How involved are you? Because I think many times we are very quick to judge and criticize things that are going on, but what are we doing either to maintain it at the area that it is, or what are we doing to change it? So when I hear his words, one of the things I think about specifically is, what's my calling and my purpose here? Where is the area that I'm gonna be making that impact to make it the best, at least of my generation? versus staying stagnant. And if you were to ask me 20 or not 20, but when, when I was 21 years old, would I have made an impact going to Peace Corps? I probably would have not been able to tell you, yes, I think I really would have made a great impact. At 21, I probably thought I'd save the world, but I made a lasting impact in people's lives. And recognizing that you are able to do that and building that power to me is the thing that I see as one of his biggest I think possibilities and the way he had it with words in terms of that quote is one of my favorite. And Kivon, how about you? Any any instant reactions to sort of that idea of making things the best or make it the last? Yeah, I think I think right now in the world we're so connected and that has both some benefits and some some negatives. But I think and, and just like Kennedy's quotes, we can make it the best or we can make it the last. And I think that through the power of global understanding and, um, and understanding others, we can really begin to learn how we can use those this, this technology that connects us all in order to push for the rights of others who, who may be disadvantaged or who may be um, overheard or, or not underprivileged, um, you, you know, use communities so that way we can really begin to fight for their rights and fight for, for things that they really, that will really benefit them. And I think that if we can use that those pieces of technology and focus on um, that public service, I think that we can make humanity better for us all. And Kivon already mentioned it, the ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country quote in President Kennedy's inauguration. If you're familiar with this quote, how does it resonate for you in 2023? How does that quote come across today? Yeah, I think that this quote really hit me while I was in the Peace Corps. I think that having this be my second time, my second experience for an ex extended period of time outside of the country. I really came to have both an appreciation as, as well as understanding the differences between the different countries that I had visited and not saying that either country was better than the other, but each country has their differences, each culture has their differences, cultural norms, expectations, et cetera. And so I think that in growing an appreciation for not only my country, but the countries that I had also served in and lived in, I was able to bring elements of each country into the into my service and back to the other countries. So it was the Peace Corps, you know, last two goals of it bringing the American experience to other countries, but also bringing other countries, your experience in other countries back to America. And I was able to do that within three different sets of countries. So really just appreciating differences is is what really led me to really want to share that with others and, and and share that experience with all the different cultures that I had visited. And um, again, just that global connectedness and, and cooperation and unity being at the forefront of that, that value system. So I think when I first hear this quote in my generation, sometimes the first thought that comes is, what is the country doing for me? What is the government? And I will say country when we talk government most of the time. What is government doing for us? What is going on here? And Sometimes I want to dis distance and say, well, like I mentioned in the previous questions, there's a little bit of a separation. What am I supposed to be doing and what is the government supposed to be doing? And I think when you connect those two, I work currently now with a program called Love Your Block and they do impact volunteering through a pretty much providing mini grants for local residents to better their community. Part of that is that engagement, I think, with the community that you're working with. For us, it was getting to know the host country that we were going to be there. I had to do a six month diagnostic in the community. You weren't told go implement a project, but you had to first learn what was going on there. What was the community's the community needs assessment? And I think there's where you're able to learn what is the way that things work. And similar here, 
when we take that here, what can we do for our country? A lot of the times, what skills do you have? What's your area of expertise and how can you leverage that to do something that you believe is a benefit? I see that many times. I'm a social worker. I'm currently getting my master's in social work, a very interesting field that I think is needed in a lot of our government areas that lends. So what can I contribute to this? And I go back to, if I'm not part of the solution, then I need to figure out how I can become a part of that solution. What, whatever problem that I'm tackling, whether it's a city problem, whether it's a, working with a client population or working with a population that's been underserved, generally, how can I contribute and leverage that? And I think that's what, he's, what he refers to here. Everyone can do something. If you're not a good public speaker, then be part of the people creating the flyers or passing out the information. We all have something to contribute. And I think we need to really feel that. And I think it's up to our leaders to also engage with us. How do they engage and activate our community? Because I don't think community work doesn't happen or there's inactive communities. I think just people that haven't maybe been given the opportunity to shine. How do you connect with them? Well, if you're doing that program, it's your job to figure that out. It might not be the same in my experience with Peru, and I'm sure Kevon, Kevon had some great experiences in his host country too. We both had to figure out how do we connect and work with the community and what they contribute to their country. It's so interesting to hear both of you talk about public service and how it sort of has changed the way you think about things and you know, coming back to the US and finding ways to continue to be active. President Kennedy had a strong belief that experiences you know, change the way we think and for President Kennedy, one of his biggest experiences was serving in World War II. He, you know, served on the front lines in the Pacific, um, got to know a lot about the world, a lot about, you know, the the people who he was serving with. President Kennedy sort of came from a well-to-do background. And, you know, when the position he asked for and was thrust into, he got to know Americans of all facets and economics and backgrounds. So I guess my question is now for you, how did the Peace Corps affect you as far as after you came back? Did it change sort of the trajectory you were on? Did you make different choices about what you wanted to do after your service based on your experience? Tell me a little bit about, you know, how the Peace Corps experience changed you and what you're doing now. I will share that Peace Corps completely changed my life. If you were to ask me in 2020, I was trying to figure out a way to stay within Peru, actually, and continue to work there for essentially for a nonprofit or see what happened. I got evacuated in 2020. I was part of the big group that got evacuated back in March and I let go of my nursing pursuit. I no longer ended up going to nursing school and I ended up applying for my master's in social work and will be hopefully graduating in May of next year. And it completely changed the way that I want to impact the world. I found a love for community activism kind of working with counterparts, getting to know them. Sometimes we don't have that lens of doing that community diagnostic in that one-to-one ratio. In Peace Corps Peru, you get placed somewhere and you have to get to know as many people as you're able to. And that's something that I think back here when I'm working right now with AmeriCorps actually, with the Love Your Block program, How do we provide the best service that we can for the community? And I define community with the VISTAs that I'm currently working with, just like in Peace Corps, I defined it with the community of Pedro Ruiz. So how do I leverage what I learned about finding the strength-based perspective? What type of interventions were able to implement with the community? And at a personal level, I learned that some of the biggest impacts are not programmatic. A lot of the biggest impacts that we have are those storytelling pieces that we have, those relationships that we built out with community members, with youth in the in the area, everything like that, I felt has been the biggest impact and has shifted that way that I think personally of my career and personal life. And Kivan, how did your placement sort of change or redirect where you were thinking about going? I mean, it was one of the most transformative experiences of my life thus far and really just changed the trajectory of my life. I mean, I knew that I wanted to um, continue to get out and go and service others abroad as much as I could. Um, And it's always been really important to me having grown up from a disadvantaged background as I have participated in some of these international experiences. One of the things that I've wanted the most at at, at different times of of these international experiences has been for, to share that experience with with other people who, who don't, who might not necessarily have the opportunity to share in that, to share that experience with my family members back home so that they can have this transformative experience as well. 
Um, and so I started Elevated Up and Out. Um, again, just to, to hit on that organization, nonprofit organization that helps underprivileged youth get their passports, go on a week long trip abroad, and then also do community service to get back to that community while they're there. And looking at also helping other Peace Corps volunteers to kind of adapt that model for themselves so that um, someone like Alejandra could could take a, a group of youth from her community abroad back to Peru and service her maybe community that she lived in and visited while she was a Peace Corps volunteer. So I think it just made me want to, being so grateful that experience of for that experience that the Peace Corps gave me, wanting to empower the next generation to have that experience, and especially those who might not otherwise have that experience of travel abroad, and, and also give other Peace Corps volunteers the experience of, of taking youth back to their own communities that they once served in as well. So trying to help as many people as possible could just continue with that global connectedness and yeah, just just that 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 power of service. Well, both of you are certainly exemplars of public service and you have great stories here. Very happy you guys were able to talk. I do have one more question. Thinking about the fact that we've been looking at President Candy's administration 60 years ago, I want us to jump ahead 60 years from today. And what do you hope that people who are looking back, the generations, three or four generations from now, look back at your time in public service? And what do you hope that they will be able to reflect on? What successes? What What do you hope that people, how people will view folks like you who have made this commitment to public service 60 years from now? Um, that's a great question. And I think about kind of what Alejandro said as well, where some of the most impactful service that you can complete is, is sometimes that one-on-one -on -one service. So Hopefully, you know, I can have a story like the young Emory student who visited my college campus or who visited my school's campus from Emory University and maybe not even know about that, that impact that I had on someone in my community's life, but just to have that impact and for, you know, not only their life to be better, but for them to also be committed to making other people's lives better as well. So I think I think in that same way, it kind of mirrors JFK's influence within the within the United States at, at such a critical time where we where everyone was divisive and kind of bringing people together. I hope that I hope that that can also be my legacy in the same way it was Kennedy's legacy. And, but hope that that our generation it, it becomes a turning point where we become more connected and on a global scale, more cooperation on a global scale, and just become more unified. And hope to see us, you know kind of bridge some of these divides and for, for promoting peace and freedom in the world and um, yeah, for the betterment of humanity. I think to answer this question, I want to share a little bit more about kind of who I was coming into the Peace Corps. I was a first generation Latina to go to the university. I think that to me is where I want to see 60 years from now. I want that diversity that Perhaps I was one of the first, one of the few. We didn't see that many Peace Corps volunteers too diverse sometimes, maybe from different states, but it wasn't a common thing to be from a Latina family and say, I'm going to leave for two years. And it, it wasn't something that I grew up hearing about. And I truly believe that that is an impact that I want to see growing forward where all communities and many more communities are able to have that opportunity, are able to see that people did this that looked like me, that had similar circumstances as me, and were able to participate in something that was so transformative in my life that it will be transformative in theirs. And also, I just see that as a big win moving forward. And when you diversify the leadership that we have in government, when you're able to see people that look like you, when you learn their stories and they share it, I think that's a better every day, whether you do that on a personal one on one or we do it at global scale with our city government, when we do it with our nonprofits, whoever our community that we're working with. I think that will be like my hope for 60 years from now is that people are talking about that and recognizing how far we've come, because 60 years ago, I don't think it was the best uh, in terms of diversity in areas like that who was able to go to the peace corps who learned about the peace corps and now me being a latina first generation having spoke spanish first rather than english i was able to be a part of that and i'm able to now share out my story and tell people what an amazing organization peace corps is and no it's not just other people it is people like you it is people that grew up in maybe not a nice neighborhood and were able to figure out how to go to college it is different areas so I think that for me would be the best moving 60 years from now. 
Well, I want to thank you both for um, joining me. This was a much longer conversation than I expected. So I appreciate you uh, hanging on and um, following all the way through. Thank you so much. I think it was a short conversation, but I want to say thank you. It's such a great time to hear about Kivon Peace Corps experience to reflect a little bit on my own. And I thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you as well. It's, it's been an honor um, and happy to have heard about Alejandra's experience. And um, it's very inspiring and happy to contribute. I also want to share that I did this on my birthday, which oh, I was very oh, happy to, to have this. I, I turned 29 today and it was, a, I spoke about it at my work, how I was doing this interview and it was just a cherry on top, I think, on my birthday and something I didn't expect. So I just wanted to shout that out because I was very happy to do it today. Well, thank you so much and happy birthday. And again, thank you both so much. And I hope you have a great rest of the day. Yes, you as well. Bye. I hope you all have a good day. President John F. Kennedy understood the work he was doing had been started by others before him and would have to be carried out by later generations after he was gone. No one could have predicted that the time would come so soon for the president. I think people could not imagine that this had happened. Uh, and many of them refused to believe it had happened. Certainly for many minutes, I think there was a sense that uh, this cannot be happening to the leader of the free world, to our president in an American city. Surely this must be some sort of mistake. Next on Let Us Begin, we will go back 60 years to November 22nd, 1963, to learn about that fateful trip to Texas and how the world reacted to the death of John F. Kennedy. <laughs>